ago. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining me. I'm sure you can hear I am not uh, 100% healthy tonight. We'll see how long the lecture actually goes this evening. <laughs> um, but thank you for joining me. Um, welcome, welcome in. Make yourselves at home. <laughs> um, throw some flowers in the chat uh, if you can hear me and if you can see me and everything's working good. Hi, Patty. Thanks for being here. Um, we will get started shortly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jen. <laughs> I have been blaming the Astro. I have 100% been blaming the Astro. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> hey, Nova. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. My goodness. Is everybody having a good end of winter? We're almost to the finish line. Sorry to the folks that love winter. I do. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I guess we could do it. <laughs> but congratulations to the folks who hate this time of year. We have almost made it into the moon. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Yay. We will get started here in just a second. Um, you know, as usual, we've got some interesting things to cover Hi, Darlene. What's up, y'all? Mm. I will probably be sipping on my water quite a bit in this. In fact, you know what? I'm probably going to pop in a cough drop. Snow on the ground still. Wow, 26 inches of snow yesterday. Wow. Sorry, that's probably really loud next to my microphone. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, holy moly. Well, that's what, that's what's up, right? That's what's up. This is the transition time. We don't jump directly from three feet of snow to 85 degrees, you know, and, and sunny. Well, <laughs> with climate change, maybe we do. <laughs> but generally speaking, right, this is the transition time. So we get some sun, we get some rain, we get some snow, we get some hail. I know here in Seattle, um, one of my favorite things about spring is how wild the weather gets. And we will literally have all four seasons in an afternoon. <laughs> You'll wake up and it'll be super foggy. Hey, Deborah, nice to see you. Um, you'll, you'll wake up and it's super foggy. The sun comes out, burns off all the fog. It's absolutely beautiful outside. And then a little breeze picks up and then hailstorm out of nowhere. And then the hailstorm will end with like a few flurries of snow. 20 minutes later, there's some rain and then like an epic downpour and then the sun. And usually if it's raining, it'll rain sideways. So <laughs> you, you people all over the country think that we're weird in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. And let me tell you, we are. <laughs> And it's because of stuff like that. <laughs> like, it's raining sideways. How am I supposed to act? <laughs> what do you want from me? All right. Hopefully the cough drop isn't too rattly. Hopefully it isn't too t distracting. Sorry, sorry. But, you know, mama's got to take care of the throat. <laughs> Hello, Doreen. Thank you for joining us. Okay. You know, let's just jump right in. Um, everybody who's late, they'll figure it out. Don't be late. Or they'll just watch the video later and it won't matter. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Megan Angus and this is Ostara 2023 Spring Equinox. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff tonight. Our kooky weather is very kooky up here in the Pacific Northwest, 100%. Um, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff tonight, but it is all going to center on the observance and the celebration of spring equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. A little bit about me. I am a witch, a pagan, a heathen, a weirdo, a freak. <laughs> um, I have been studying witchcraft and paganism in various forms for almost 40 years. Yes, really. 
I've been teaching these classes since 2015, um, and now I teach them for free here on YouTube thanks to the incredible and freakish support of my super weird patrons. <laughs> hi, Vanessa. Hi, nice to see you. Um, and, uh, and so this is all their fault. <laughs> this is all their fault. <laughs> um, if you love what you see here, there is a link in the comment section um, here on this video. You can always throw a tip in my tip jar on Venmo. Much appreciated. If you want to subscribe to Patreon as a means of supporting this work, thank you so much. And folks who subscribe at the Venus level and higher, which is $9 a month and higher, uh, get access to the Patreon Bag of Holding, wherein we have the workbook that I'm going to be referring to tonight, our calendar, digital spells, and whatever oddities I feel like throwing into the folder for you guys. Um, you get behind-the-scenes stuff, you get things that I don't publish on my website, don't publish uh, in public or put in the podcast, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and what else? I don't know. You guys get all kinds. You get you get all kinds of stuff, don't you? <laughs> um, and uh, and and the warm feeling of knowing that you are um, <laughs> encouraging this. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much to my patrons. Um, I am teaching this uh, here, as I said, in so-called Seattle, Washington. Um, which is ancestral Duwamish territory. Uh, many, many thank yous to the Duwamish people who still have not received uh, federal recognition. Um, please go sign the, um, the petition to encourage our federal government to give these folks federal recognition. Um, we are big fans of reparations around here. Uh, <laughs> if we're really doing real magic, it matters. <laughs> um, what else do I want to say before we get going? Um, uh, if you're new here, uh, you haven't heard this. If you are not new, <laughs> and I know a lot of you are old, <laughs> um, you've heard this before. But we will refer to gender tonight from time to time, but don't get too hung up on it. Um, we're not so worried about um, what is in anybody's pants as, as it is about an energetic expression when we talk about the goddess. Sometimes we are talking about vaginas and uteruses, but a lot of times we're talking about an energy that all humans can embody that is about receptivity, that is about magnetism, that is about attraction, and is also about um, the, the capacity to gestate the capacity to hold the the capacity to nurture and 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 yet also be fierce and be um uh creative and be um determinative and we're going to talk about uh that face of the goddess quite a bit in this class and we are going to talk about gods and sometimes when we're talking about gods we are talking about penises and testicles but most of the time we're talking about that energy that all humans contain um that is about thrust energy, that is about extrovert energy, that is about uh, also being determinative, but also being nurturing and protective um, and fostering things in the world and all of that good stuff. So um, we know from our magical studies, or if we don't know, we will know by the end of tonight, um, that all of the gods and goddesses are capable of all of these things. And all the gods and goddesses are in us. And that means that we are all capable of these things too. Um, so there's that. And um, anything else? I don't know. Is there something else I'm supposed to be saying at this point? Oh, uh, I teach these classes here. I have a Patreon. I have a website, meganangus.com. Um, and I host a weekly podcast called Spinning the Wheel Podcast, which is where a lot of you guys have found me. Um, and uh, that's where we get into the more granular details each week of the stuff that we are going to overview in this class tonight. Um, last, last thing, and then we actually get into the, the thick of it. Um, we are going to talk about uh, paganism, heathenry, and witchcraft from a modern perspective, some. But a lot of what I talk about in these classes is definitely based in history, and it is really my passion and I feel like it's almost my job to help you connect the dots between what we do now in the modern era as pagans and witches and heathens 
and what our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors were doing. Um, I feel like it's partly my job to help us connect the dots between cultures as well, to understand that the further back we go in history, the more unified a lot of this stuff is. Not everything, but a lot of it. And um, it's also very important to celebrate the differences. Uh, it's really important, I think, to understand that many cultures around the planet have acknowledged these moments in the seasons and in the shift of the sun and time and timekeeping and all of that stuff. And there can be synchronicity between cultures that didn't actually have contact with each other. We don't want to blur the lines there too much. We want to recognize that they were doing the same thing or doing something similar, but maybe with very different motivations, or they were doing very different things with very similar motivations. Um, and then also, I think it's really cool when we can trace that stuff back and we go, oh, wait, this is related to that and to that and to that. So we have a little bit of that kind of stuff going on here this evening and in most of our classes. So with that, um, let us begin. Uh, this is our wheel that we are working with. These wheels were illustrated by Ryan Jack Allred, an incredible illustrator here in Seattle, Washington. Hit him up if you need some stuff. Uh, he's a great artist. So what are we doing in Ostara season? We are coming back. We are coming back from the lands of the dead. We have made our way from winter solstice through Yule season, through in bulk season, and now we are arriving at the doorstep of spring. And this is truly a resurrection of the natural energies here in the Northern Hemisphere on planet Earth. And we see this around us uh, happening day in and day out. The sun is slowly climbing higher and higher in the sky, and the plants are slowly coming back to life. What was frozen ground, or might still be frozen ground, with <laughs> several of us still having quite a bit of snow on the ground, um, what was snow on the ground is now melting, or will be melting soon, and is beginning to reveal crocuses and snowdrops and other flowers. Um, that are those first harbingers of the shift in the energy. And shifting and shape changing are two very important uh, sort of umbrella concepts for us to work with in uh, Ostara season. In Imbolc season, we're doing a lot of drifting. In Ostara season, we're doing a lot of shifting. And that's that's correct. That's where we want to be in the energetic process. Um, again, in Yule, we have our winter solstice and we have a type of death. We see the sun die, as it were, on the uh, eastern and western horizon three days in a row. And the sun for us in the northern hemisphere is very, very low in the sky. There's very little light. Certain parts of the globe, there's no light at all. Literally, the sun does not come up over the horizon for days or weeks or even months. Um, and for those of us around the world where the sun does come up, it doesn't come up very high. Uh, doesn't stay in the sun, it doesn't stay in the sky for very long. It moves back down below the, the western horizon. And it's cold, and we see all of life sort of shut down. And it's natural and right for us to kind of shut down or slow down with that process. We see a lot of animals hibernate. Uh, we see a lot of animals change colors and turn white during that time period. And so it's kind of like the life and the, and the light and the color from the world is sort of leached away. And we see the goddess at that time of year in her crone aspect or in their crone aspect, which is you know, as I say in those classes, probably her most abstract uh, and disconnected form. She's sort of remote. She's sort of distant, or they are sort of remote and distant. And, uh, and it can feel almost like the goddess has abandoned us or left us to our own devices, if we want to be more neutral in our language there. And you know, we can't rely on the earth 
during winter the way that we can rely on the earth during summer to provide us food, to provide us animals to hunt or fish to, to fish. Um, and we're, we're, we're left to sort of fend for our, ourselves and figure it out, which is the basis of a lot of our incredible harvest time rituals and celebrations throughout August, September, and October, and even a little bit into November, but not so much, um, as a means of preparing for that, right? Well, who knew to prepare? The elders of the community, aka the crones, the wise ones, the teachers, the people who have lived through hardship before, and they know what needs to be done to carry us through that dark season and the cold of that season. And then we move into in bulk season after Yule. And in bulk season can be a really tough time for folks because it's like, when is this going to end? We are just drifting in this gray, hazy, nebulous, chilly, you know, sensory deprived kind of space. And yet that too is really part of the process for us in in bulk season we are slowly coming out of the death of winter solstice, but we haven't quite come back to life yet either. And so we are drifting in the womb or the spaces of possibility. And we work with a goddess form who is bright and fiery, but definitely a wisdom keeper goddess, um, teaching skills, teaching crafts, um, and... Again, you know, kind of a crone energy, a mother energy, but a crone type energy. And part of why I'm, I'm harping on this is because a big, a huge central <laughs> element of our movement from in bulk season into Ostara season is shifting from that crone energy, that elder energy, that teacher energy, that wise one energy forward, not backwards, forwards into maiden energy. And I use maiden as a word to both refer to a form of the triple goddess, but also as a, a, a generic word to just mean youthful and really naive. And so what are we saying here? That we, we die at winter solstice, we become the embodiment of the wise ones. We're under the auspices of the crone and the wise ones and the elders. It's the elders and the knowledgeable who are getting us through winter and through these hard times. And then we're supposed to just kind of give all of that up when we hit spring? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's something really potent, I think, in the archetype of thinking about the crone evolving forward into the maiden the wise one who evolves forward into the one that does not know and how does that work well this is some of my subjective spiritual understanding um, so I'll say that first I don't know that this is necessarily in a book on Wicca anywhere but um, to know is a type of burden to be aware, to, to carry knowledge, to carry wisdom, to carry experience, and to accumulate it is a type of a burden. It's a gift, and it's certainly a tool that we can help ourselves and we can help other people with, but it's also a burden in the sense that it weighs us down, it slows us down, and it guards us from making mistakes it guards us from harm, but wisdom and experience and uh, accumulated knowledge is also very Saturnian in that it creates a pretty intense border or boundary. Here's what I know, here's what I don't know, and I'm staying here where I know what's up and I know how things work. This is going to keep me safe, it's going to keep my people safe. But it also keeps me from growing. It also keeps me from experimenting. And experimentation and growth is specifically the type of energy that we need to be stepping into in spring. 
So the way that I imagine this is that the crone, whoever they are, us, the gods, whatever, is sitting in their wisdom, sitting in their lived experiences, sitting in their accumulated knowledge. And they are illuminated and enlightened by this, and they are sharing this with other people and keeping people safe, but at the same time, they're weighed down by it, they're slowed down, and growth and experimentation are stopped. Which makes sense, right? During winter season, we're not experimenting and we're not growing. But as we move through in bulk season, we begin to drift. And in that drifting space, we see all of the things that we could possibly become in spring, all the different directions that we might go, all of the various seeds that we might plant. And if we allow only our wisdom, our lived experiences, our accumulated knowledge to guide which seeds we pick and which adventures we choose, we are going to err on the side of safety. We're going to err on the side of, I already know how this works. So, you know, let me stick with what I know. We might even err on the side of, I've already done this before. I don't need to do it again. I've already done something like this before. I don't need to try the new version of it. And we really stagnate ourselves. We stagnate our communities by doing that. And so spring offers us this opportunity to shrug all of that stuff off. But I don't think it's exactly that. I think that what we're seeing is the crone coming into such a deep level of knowing that they begin to know exactly where they don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> like they become so wise that, that they are able to see the edge of their wisdom and where at maybe the beginning of Yule season or, or even the beginning of Imbolc season, the crone is sitting there in their wisdom and it's all encompassing. It's, it's their world. By the end of Imbolc season and as we approach spring, they've become so big and, the, and so vast, they've p moved out into the universe so deeply that they are able to come to the edge of what they know and remember, oh, right, there's all this other stuff I don't actually know. I've still not done everything, right? And you could live a thousand years. There's always going to be a song you've never heard before, a food you've never tasted, uh, a dance step you've never learned before. There's always going to be something new out there. You could live 100,000 years and there would still be some element of human experience that you had never encountered before. And if we stay in that place of deep knowing, we forget where we don't know. And when we move into that place of not knowing and remembering that we don't know at all, and here's everything I do know, but let me push that off to the side for just a second and sit in this place of, I don't know, we get to do it all over again. And we get to renew that energy for ourselves, for our people, for our community and all of that stuff. So as we will talk about throughout this class, to some extent, it's my belief that us witches and pagans and heathens, this is a big part of our job at Spring Equinox, is to remind people what they don't know. Remind people of the chaos, remind people of experimentation, of newness, of naivety and foolishness, and trying things out again and starting things up for the first time again. Are you ready to begin again, is one of the things I like to say at this time of year. So... <laughs> excuse me there's probably going to be a lot of that I apologize so looking at some of our names for this day uh, ladies day Alban Eiler summer finding I do in Shilina gigs day Maslanitsa ladies day this is in reference to all of the various goddesses that are being worshipped at this time of year Alban Eiler is the a uh, druidic a name for this, and it literally means um, the light of the earth, or the light of the earth is returning. 
Summer Finding harkens to uh, the various groups that see this time of year as the legitimate beginning of summer. A lot of groups also see Beltane as the beginning of summer. Idun and her golden apples is one of the main goddesses that we work with at this time of year. And Sheila Nagig, one of my personal favorite goddesses, such a raunchy bitch. Uh, <laughs> goddess bless. Um, Sheila Nagig is a an embodiment of crone energy who I think is a perfect encapsulation of this. One of my favorite stories about her is that uh, Shilani Gig is sitting next to a sacred well. Sacred wells, of course, being very important during Imbolc season. And she's cooking a little stew, you know, as witches do, right? Stirring the cauldron. And these three knights come up. Three magical numbers there, right? These three knights come up and they're really hungry and they ask for some food. And she's like, no sweat. Uh, just one little kiss right here. And two of the knights are like, I'm good. You know what? I'm just going to wait until we uh, make it back to the lodge. And I'm just going to eat this hard tack that I found in the bottom of my backpack. But one of the knights is like, just a kiss? Or do you want to like uh, warm it up a little bit next to the fire? And so, as we like to say here uh, in the classes and on the podcast, they engage in the sacred knocking of boots. And... Um, in the midst of this, she turns into a young woman again. And there's something there about, you know, vitality and, and sexual energy and all of that stuff. But there's also, you know, something very explicit about the crone turning into, forward into the maiden through this energy that might be solar energy with that three day, three night thing. Um, so we love that. Maslanitsa, we talked about on the podcast just a couple of weeks ago. This is a holiday uh, that is also known as Martinitsa uh, and a couple of other names throughout Central and Eastern Europe. All of our Slavic friends and ancestors have been celebrating this for quite some time. Um, and uh, it can be placed somewhere in March, generally. Um, sometimes it comes right after the uh, carnival, uh, and sometimes it's much closer to the actual equinox. Uh, but it's somewhere here in the center of March. And this is just another um, incredible spring resurrection energy type of um, holiday. So before we get too far into that stuff, what is Equinox? What is it? Well, it is literally um, equal night and equal day. It's the, the, a Latin word, pretty sure, <laughs> that means equa nox, equal night, but also equal day. And this graphic is uh, courtesy of NASA. Thanks. That was our tax dollars, I'm assuming. They probably paid for that, so I felt um, obliged to borrow it. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and here we see uh, the Earth in its orbit around the sun. And we, uh, our globe is at a 23 degree tilt. The axis, the North Pole and South Pole axes do not point straight up and down. Side note, there is no up or down in space, but you know, we'll humor them. Uh, it tilts off to the side a little bit. That tilt is a big part of why we have seasons and why it isn't just the same all year long. Uh, when, when we are at one point in our um, orbit here. Let me see if I can point to it here. <laughs> when we're at one point in our orbit, uh, quite a bit of the globe is in shadow. The Southern hemisphere is getting a lot of sunlight. That is winter solstice. And then if we move up to the top, we're at a different point in our orbit around the sun and the exposure uh, to that light is equal. Even though the tilt is there, we're not tilted forward away from the sun. The whole side of the planet is getting equal exposure. That's our spring equinox. Then we move over to summer solstice and you can see that the Northern hemisphere is tipped towards the sun, which is why the days grow longer and it gets much hotter. And the Southern hemisphere is tipped away 
And that's when they are experiencing winter. And then down at the bottom, we have another equinox moment. That's our fall equinox before we head off into winter again and on and on. So this is the basic gig of that. So there's another phenomenon, though, that is created by this tilt. And that is the alemna. The alemma is a shape that is created in the sky by the sun's pattern. If you were to take a photograph of the sun every single day at the same time of day, you would see it create this shape in the sky. And, uh, and you know, in individual dots, and I will show you this in just a moment. Um, now, I want you guys to pay attention to this shape because it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we've got this smaller oval at the top, larger oval at the bottom, and the fact that it does this little S-curve thing, you know, this little loop-de-loop -loop kind of moment, that is in part because of our tilt. Um, where these uh, pieces meet, there in the middle, those are our equinoxes. The point at the top, that's our summer solstice. The point at the bottom, that's our winter solstice. And note also that the two halves are not equal. That's because Earth is not, or excuse me, the sun is not perfectly centered in our orbit around it. Um, our orbit is an oval, partly here, hence the oval shape. Our, our orbit is not a perfect circle around the sun. It's elongated. It's more of an oval. And the sun is not perfectly centered in that. It's off to one side. So for part of our orbit, we're actually a little bit closer to the sun. For part of our orbit, we're actually a little further away from the sun. We talk about this at the, uh, the, the solstice classes, the summer solstice and winter solstice classes. Which end... Now, if you already know the answer to this, don't, don't put it in, in chat. But... Which end do you think is winter solstice and summer solstice in terms of when we're closer to the sun or when we're further away from the sun? Are we closer to the sun at winter solstice or closer to the sun at summer solstice? Are we further away at winter solstice or are we further away at summer solstice? Put in the chat if you, uh, if you want to guess. And I'll answer that question in just a second. So here is a photograph by Anthony... Read the name on the screen. Thank you, Anthony, for letting me borrow your photograph. This was taken uh, in Greece, obviously. And this was him going out at noon every single day. Well, not every day. Probably, a, a, you know, once a week. And taking a picture of the sun wherever it was in the sky. And this is the shape that is created. The reason that it's pointing straight up and down is because he's taking this photo at noon. If he had taken it at dawn, it would be tilted this way. If he had taken it closer to sunset, it would be tilted this way. And that is because the sun moves like so across the sky. Um, but this is an example of how much in height across the sky the sun moves between the summer solstice and the winter solstice. Um, it, uh, you know, when we talk about it being dark in, in winter... And, oh, the sun barely rose at all. We, we mean it. We literally mean it. Look at how low in the sky the sun is at noon on winter solstice compared to how high in the sky the sun is at noon on summer solstice. Quite a big shift there. But also, that's a pretty important magical symbol, isn't it? That's basically our infinity symbol. Right? And... We see this shape in some pretty important places. Um, some of those places we're going to talk about in this class. So here is a small diagram of what I was talking about with our orbit around the sun. That's this oval. And here's our sun. I'm moving the mouse around. Can you even, can you guys see it when I move the mouse around? No, you cannot. All right, because I'm crazy. Um... Wait, can you see it? <laughs> like, am I moving my mouse? Can you see that? No, you can't. Okay. Um, so we see the oval. That's our orbit around the sun. We see that little dot there. That's the sun. And we can see that not only is our 
orbit, not a circle, but it's an oval. And But we can also see that the sun is not perfectly centered and it, it's off to one side. Now, what we are seeing here in this diagram in these three egg shapes, hmm, eggs, is that a thing at this time of year? Oh yeah, it is, isn't it? Huh. Um, is these different date markers or are these different date markers and we have now up in the top corner and then we have about 5,000 years ago in the middle and we have about 11,000 years ago down here in the bottom right this is important because where the long end and where the short end is is not the same throughout time that actually shifts but currently we are at the place where at winter solstice we are the closest to the sun. And at summer solstice, we are the furthest away. Now, this is called the aphelion and the perihelion, this closest to the sun and furthest away from the sun. The aphelion is uh, closest and perihelion is furthest away. The perihelion currently, July 4th. Hmm, there's some symbolism for you, but we'll talk about that more in summer solstice class. <laughs> But I just, I love this because this really bleeds into a lot of our understanding of the lengths of the seasons and why certain eras fixated on certain seasons more than others and why certain seasons, you know, why spring might have been depicted in one way, uh, you know, for one group of people and it's depicted a different way for another group of people. I think that this plays into that stuff, but this is a, this is a whole class in and of itself, this conversation here. So... Uh, have people been studying this? Have people been tracking this throughout time? You bet your sweet ass they have. Uh, we have megalithic sites all over the planet that talk about this. Uh, Eve, you were right 11,000 years ago. <laughs> Nova, you are correct now. <laughs> so we're all right in turn, right? A clock is right twice a day or twice a Several millennia apart. <laughs> okay. So taking a look here, um, we have Machu Picchu. This was uh, a site that was built in Peru about 600 years ago. And this pillar is called the place where the sun is tied. And what happens is on the equinox, this little pillar piece that's right in the center casts no shadow. This will cast a shadow every other single day of the year, except on the spring equinox and the vernal equinox. Are these the only folks to track this? No, sir. No, ma'am. Whichever you prefer. And everybody who knows better. Here's Angkor Wat. Uh, Angkor Wat is in Cambodia. This was built around 1125 current era. Um, and this is a site that was originally dedicated to Vishnu. Um, it was converted to a Buddhist temple. And at the uh, spring equinox, the sun rises directly over the point of this top temple, a uh, top piece in the temple. Is this the, are these the only sites? Nope. This is the temple of Kukul Khan. Uh, it's also known as El Castillo, but that is the Spanish name for this. This is Chichen Itza. Uh, and before that, it was the Pyramid of Kukul Khan. And this is a Mayan site uh, built around 1,000, uh, 1,000 current era. And uh, what happens here is at the equinox, as the sun rises, uh, it skims over these steps. The, these, this is a step pyramid. It skims over the corners of this. If you're watching from a particular angle, it literally looks like the sun is kind of climbing up it. But if you watch from another angle... It creates the effect that light uh, is hitting this serpent uh, sculpture that runs down the face of the temple, and it makes it look like the serpent is actually waving and, and, and wiggling up and down. At fall equinox, it goes in the opposite direction. Uh, you gotta love it. This was about 1,200 years ago. Anything older? Yes. Here in the United States, Chaco Canyon. This is ancestral Pueblo territory um, uh, found in New Mexico. Um, this was built between 900 and 1100 CE, so approximately 1100 years ago. Um, 
and we see this spiral shape that was uh, cut into the cliff face and at noon on spring equinox you get this dagger of light that pierces right into the spiral this is also uh, Chaco Canyon uh, this center black and white photo there is so much to say about this archaeological site it does not have the um, dramatic structure of a place like Stonehenge but it has just as not a much if not more um, anthropological and archaeological importance as sites like Stonehenge or uh, New Grange or, or other places like that. Anybody else? Yes. Pushing back further into time we have uh, the Pyramid of the Sun. This is the largest pyramid in Mexico. Uh, Teotihuacan, uh, Mesoamerican. This was built around uh, 2000 ish years ago or right around zero current era uh and at the spring equinox and the fall equinox exactly one half of the pyramid is lit and exactly one half of the pyramid is uh in shadow yeah chaco canyon absolutely beautiful place really intense energies there even though it's sort of an abandoned site you can feel that there's there's something going on there and it's really really cool um, but yeah, this pyramid is half and half on the equinoxes. Equal night, equal day, right? Is this it? No. New Grange, also known as Bruna Boyne. Uh, this is in Ireland. This was built uh, around 3200 before current era, uh, County Meath, Ireland. So approximately 4800 years ago. And uh, this is a huge burial mound, temple mound, and observatory and maybe some other stuff we don't know exactly what all was going on here um and this is what is inside of that temple and at the equinoxes and the solstices uh the light will um illuminate this shaft in different ways and uh, different things that are carved on the walls are illuminated is this it nope Pushing back further into time, in Malta, we have Menagera. Now, first of all, look at those shapes down at the bottom. Are those two oval-shaped circles stacked on top of each other? Interesting. And we have three of them together. And at the equinoxes and the solstices, sunlight will pierce directly into the back of the furthest chambers in them through these doorways uh, that have these really intense gateways around them. Um, here is another uh, graphic of that. And so this was 6,000 years ago. Uh, Menagera built 3,600 before current era. So approximately 6,000 years ago, humans here were tracking this. Uh, is this the oldest site? No, no, it's not. Pushing back further to Almendrez Comlec in Portugal, um, another incredible site and here we see an even better description of that shape that we saw the sun making in the sky yeah right hmm, indeed i'm sure it's just a coincidence as we like to say around here <laughs> but here we go and so we have the little circle and the big circle and what we're seeing is the development and the uh, destruction of this site over time uh, it started out as a single circle and then that little graphic that's there, uh, the upper right hand corner uh, was the second stage, the bottom left, the third stage, and the and the four, bottom uh, right is where it is currently that a lot of these stones have been scattered. But what's really wild to me is that many of these stones in this site actually have a perfectly flat surface at the top. And Archaeologists have a variety of opinions around what was happening with that perfectly flat surface, but some folks think that they might have been doing micro calculations and had things carved into the surfaces of some of these rocks that they were able to do like even smaller measurements in the sky by placing it on top of this rock. Um, or that those rocks were flat on purpose to know that this was a place that where we, you always want to stand right here to be able to see uh, what it is that you're trying to find. Um, most of these sites track the solstices. They also track the equinoxes. Not all megalithic sites track both solstice and equini. 
Uh, some only do one, some only do the other. Seems like if it only does one, um, the solstices often tend to be the one that, that is tracked. Uh, but we do have a few megalithic sites around that are just focused on, um, on uh, the equinoxes. So is this our oldest site that we know of so far that tracks the equinox? No, it is not. Let's go to Egypt, to the Nabta Playa. This is in southern Egypt. This was established approximately 9,500 years ago, nearly 10,000 years ago. This tracks not only the solstices and the equinoxes, this site also tracks uh, the heliacal risings of several fixed stars, uh, and on and on and on. They recently found um, a carving of a cow-headed goddess that might be uh, Hathor or the predecessor to Hathor. Uh, yeah, that kind of cool stuff. Now, we know that we have... Um, uh, sites that are older even than Nabta Playa because this was 7500 BCE and we have sites like Katul Hayuk, Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe that were probably built or at least where they have been currently dated is around 11,000 years ago around 900 or 9,000 to 9,500 9, BCE um, and not enough exploration has been done in those places yet but uh, this last year or the winter before that, I can't remember if it was this winter just now or the, or a year ago, somebody was at Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, somebody was at Gobekli Tepe and found an alignment there for winter solstice. So this science that our ancestors were engaging in of tracking the solstices, tracking the movement of the sun, tracking the equinoxes goes back probably provably at least almost 10,000 years but probably closer to 11,000 12,000 uh with you know the whatever it is that we're going to discover at places like Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, uh Kato Hayuk and probably further back than that um and that is implied by a bunch of different stuff so let me now introduce you to a very interesting goddess named Kybel. Uh, this is a Roman bust. Actually, it was, it's a full sculpture. This is just her head. Uh, this is a, a, a Roman depiction of Kybel. And Kybel is uh, also known as Sybil. Um, she's also Ceres. And Kybel was a world builder, or is a world builder. And... She's often depicted with a wall or a gate on her head as a means of showing that she built worlds, that worlds were built upon her. Um, but she is very uh, intensely tied to energy that we might think of connected to Aries or even the Emperor card in the sense of being first a pioneer, a vanguard, going where no one has gone before, building something where nothing has been built before. And this is, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively modern uh, depiction of her. Um, pushing back into time, this is a slightly older depiction of her. And note the lions on either side of her. She's also carrying a disc uh, in both hands, but one of them in particular is thought to be a hand drum called a, a rachetta. We're going to want to pay attention to that as we move through class. Here's another picture of her with her hand drum. And if you can look at it very carefully, you can see a cross hatching pattern on the surface of that drum. Um, there are two items in history that are referred to as a resha, a rachetta, a rachetto. Uh, one is a hand drum that had a woven surface on it it might have also uh and that woven surface might have been from like goat gut or twine tied in knots um it might have also been fish scales or something along those lines and then we also have an item with the same name that looks very very similar that was a sieve that was used for catching fish and we're going to talk more about this stuff. We're going to tie all of these ends together as we move along. But she is often depicted uh, carrying this. Now, that's kind of interesting, right? Because we have Pisces just leaving us as we step into Aries season. That's the, the, that's the sign that oversees the very end of this. And 2,000 years ago, Pisces was the sign that oversaw 
spring equinox. It was just starting. Um, actually, a little bit more than 2,000 years ago. It was just starting. Um, and then in our era, we think of it as Aries just starting. It's actually the other way around <laughs> because of the precession of the equinoxes. It gets a little confusing, but... Um, but very interesting, right? That's, uh, that's there, maybe there's something there. So this is a shield depicting, um, a, a Sibylline or a Kybel in, uh, procession. This is Kybel being pulled in her chariot with her card sort Attis. Uh, we will talk about, uh, Kybel and one of her great holidays here in just a little bit. Um, she's being pulled by a chariot that has wheels with eight spokes. The chariot is pulled by four lions or two lions with two heads apiece, but I think they're four lions. And then what we can't see in the rest of this shield, but you can look this up online, um, are other depictions of other animals from the Zodiac. So we have multiple uh, elements in this one shield dedicated to this goddess that are depictions of time, depictions of the seasons um, and time and the seasons were ways of people communicating to each other and to other civilizations. We know how to grow food. We know how to provide for ourselves. We know how to read the clock gears of the sky. We understand what all of that stuff does and what it's for. So be afraid because we're powerful people. We know how this stuff works. Um, these elements are going to come into play as we go along. So another depiction here, this is Diana of Hephaestus, Ephesus or um, Artemis of Ephesus, Hephaestus, um, and many people have seen this. Note the gate or the building, the structure that's on top of her head that she's wearing like a crown, right? This is a version of the same deity. And uh, many people have thought that these were her many breasts, and they might be. Some other folks think that these are actually bull's testicles on her chest. Either way, the idea was to depict virility, fertility, and abundance, and the, and the capacity to spring forth life and spring forth the stuff you need to do what you want to do here on earth. It's kind of difficult to see in this picture, but... She has lions up and down her arms, kind of guarding her on either side. And the first row of animals underneath her breasts or her testicles, whichever they are, um, are a row of lions. And there's other animals that run down her skirt. Again, people have various theories about it. I have a feeling that they are animals that probably uh, had big migratory or mating patterns that people followed as a means of time telling and time tracking. Um, to sync up their growth cycles with. Uh, okay. This is yet another depiction of this same deity. And why I wanted to focus in on this is, one, uh, this wreath that runs around them is very similar to the wreath that we see in the world card. Uh, no time to talk about that, but just know that that's true. But if we look very carefully at the details above this wreath, and below the collar of her neck, this area here, we see these four angels. There's our four portions of the year. And in between them, we see symbols for the zodiac. You can see a crab. You can see uh, there at the bottom, there's two people. That's Gemini. Off on the other side, there's a bull. Up on her shoulder, there's uh, Aries, the ram. And so this was yet another way of people depicting, we know how to tell time. We understand the procession of the the zodiacal procession procession as the sun moves through the year but we also understand the zodiacal precession of the equinox slowly moving backwards through the eras uh through the through the signs so this character also has lions on her shoulders and or on her arms and so this is a figurine that was found at Katul Hayuk um, and note, she has lions on either side of her. Now, some folks believe that, uh, we have been able as a species 
to tell time by looking at the sky for a very, very long time. And that the great eras of time are chopped up into these um, millennial pieces. And currently we are in uh, the Piscean Age. Uh, and that is because even though in tropical astrology, stick with me, this is going to get a little confusing, but you've got this. In tropical astrology, which is the astrology that we practice here in the West, what we say is that Aries, zero degrees of Aries, is happening at the same time as the spring equinox. And uh, actually, <laughs> if we are talking about astronomy, and we could see the sun in the sky with the constellations behind it, it would actually look like the sun is traveling through the sign of Pisces, the sign preceding Aries, right? So there's there's our word, P-R-E, pre, preceding. The sun is actually traveling through the sign of Pisces and has been for the last 2,000 years. Now, what is one of the symbols for one of the great religions of Earth currently, right? The Catholic Church, Christianity, often depicts Jesus as the fish, right? There is there is that thing. That is because we are truly in the Piscean era. And that church was built in a time when that's what you did. You identified your deity with the prevailing sign that the sun was starting the year in, which would have been Pisces. Um, before that, uh, you would have Aries. Before that, you would have had Aries. And so 2,300 years ago, 2,000-ish years ago, right? 2,000 years ago, that's kind of a pivotal moment in time, right? We like literally set our calendars and our timekeeping systems by this moment. Um, before Jesus, what was happening? Well, we had Moses, we had several other characters who had ram's heads, who were depicted with ram's horns or ram's heads. And note how flat these horns are. Um, many people think that this is because uh, part of the, um, part of the uh, symbolism here of like, why, was, why were rams such a big deal? Not just because of the constellation, but also because um, these rams were having their migratory system, migratory uh, moment and mating moments at this time of year. So yes, we have the constellation in the sky, but also we have this happening on Earth. Even perhaps that's why those stars in the sky were identified as rams was because this was happening down here on Earth. And note how wide set their horns are. So 2,000 years ago, it was all about ramhead gods and goddesses. And we even see uh, on one of these, these are both Egyptian uh, deities. Um, hey, go back. There we go. Sorry. Uh, we even see that there are serpents coming and going. Uh, the figure that's on the right. Uh, this is Beneb Jeanette. If you've been taking my classes for a while, you know I got deep love for Beneb Jeanette. Cool dude. Um, and this was also hearkening to uh, the hibernation and mating cycles of serpents going underground or coming back up again the blue head being about rain cycles flood cycles and drought cycles um, or at least dry season cycles um, and again timekeeping timekeeping what do we have before aries we have taurus and there is our 2000 plus era chunk of time marked by cow-headed goddesses. So we roll back and we roll back through time and eventually what we're going to have is the spring equinox in alignment with Leo. Just gonna just gonna leave that there and move on. So you know our our various sites that we have here marking this stuff that is one symbol set that people could look for. Uh, has the archaeological world 
completely come to a, a, a total agreement on this stuff? Absolutely not. Um, and within the folks that do talk about this stuff, there's a lot of folks that have done a lot of very legitimate research and there's a lot of folks who have not. <laughs> so put your tinfoil hat on when you go onto the internet and you go to research this for yourself. Just know that like it gets a little wild out there. Um, and there can also be a lot of erasure uh, of like genuine uh, cultural advancements in people, especially folks with darker skin. Uh, it subtly is aliens. It couldn't possibly have been, you know, those people. It, it had to be aliens. So just watch out for that. <laughs> but... This is a really, really cool theory, and the more sites that we find that are older and older and older, the more we find these same uh, collections of animals that represent these great, or possibly represent these great eras. So, there's a little bit of that. Okay, so coming back to this, right? Um, interesting stuff here. So, what next? Let's jump back to the present day. For, um, for witches, pagans, and heathens, the work that we are doing here uh, really focuses on birth, fertility, preparing people in the land for activity, acknowledge, acknowledging the balance of darkness and light, initiation and rites of passage. And for me, that really sits pretty nicely with a lot of this stuff that we just talked about. World building. Um, stepping into action, stepping into uh, uh, the new, stepping into the, I don't know, I've never been here before. Um, let me go through a ritual or a process that can prepare me for whatever this adventure is that I'm about to go on, like adulthood, for example. I still have not gone through that ritual. <laughs> but truly, haha, jokes aside. Um, uh, rites of initiation are something that any of us can engage in throughout our lives. Uh, if you are a person who has a period and you never had a period party, have one at Ostara. Why not? If you are a person who has suddenly sprouted hair in a brand new place and that feels like you're going through a type of puberty, have a puberty party. Why not? Um, have you passed a particular age marker and it feels like you've gone through a particular gate? Have an initiation party. Why not? Um, all of these things are sort of acknowledging, I've never been here before. Let me welcome myself into the newness of this experience and whatever I may encounter here. And in that, see how I keep doing this? I'm like, well, whatever it is, that's at the heart of Ostara. I don't know. I don't know what's about to happen. And I'm celebrating the fact that this is new. I've never been here before. I've never done this before. This thing has never had me before. <laughs> and we're all about to find out, right? We're going to fuck around. We're going to find out. It's going to be cute. Um, but other magic that we can do for ourselves in our community is acknowledging the balance of darkness and light. Uh, we do not leap directly into high-speed action. Uh, it is a waking up to this thing. Um, we want to introduce ourselves to the new process, shake hands with it, have a little small talk first, and then jump in. Um, and when it comes to things like fertility, yes, human fertility does have quite a bit of emphasis here at Ostara, but plant world and animal world, I think, has more emphasis in terms of fertility and virility. Uh, Beltane is very, very, very focused on human fertility and virility. Uh, here at Ostara, a little bit less. So we're preparing ourselves and we're preparing the land for whatever it is that's about to come next. Okay. Uh, before we get into that, let me say this. Reading from the book, uh, the goddess completes her transformation and becomes the embodiment of youthful springtime energy, reborn, they are radiant, dynamic, and curious. And the sun continues to rise in power under the mantle of the Oak King. Some groups hail this as the return of the Greed Band. This is the start of his annual surge and fall of power, which peaks at Letha and culminates at Maybon or Fall Equinox. Okay. So when we look around the world currently and back in time, do what type of stuff do we see? 
uh, in our holidays around spring equinox, much of the same thing. Beginnings, fertility, initiations, rejoicing the return of life and the sun and light. And much of this stuff, and I really want to emphasize this, much of this stuff is overseen by um, femme goddesses and deities of mutable or alternating gender. So we have a lot of deities that oversee this stuff that gender is like, meh, I'll, I'll be whatever I need to be, like <laughs> be whatever I feel like being. Um, and so there's that shape-shifting and that 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 shifting and shape-shifting thing that we that we want to emphasize here at Ostara. I'm trying on all kinds of stuff. I'm seeing what fits and what I like and what feels good. And I'm experimenting here. And I'm going to, you know, witness the uh, situation and become what feels good as a response to that. All of that kind of stuff. So as we look around the globe and throughout time, we see cultures all over the Northern Hemisphere participating in rituals and festivals, celebrating fertility initiations, rejoicing the return of life during the uh, quarter holiday. And some of the holidays that we see at this time in uh, literally on like the 20th, the 21st, like right on the solstice itself, or excuse me, the equinox itself, uh, the Oshi, Oshosi Hunter Festival from our Yoruba friends and ancestors. Uh, Demuzi uh, returns from the underworld from our Mesopotamian friends and ancestors. The Aketu Feast of Marduk from our Babylonian friends and ancestors. And you all know I have beef with Marduk. If you see him, tell him he owes me five fucking dollars because I'm not done with that guy. Seriously. Um, and anybody who's offended by that, uh, Marduk is also Jupiter, and that's my ruling planet. So if anybody here can give Marduk shit, it's me. And if I can't, I'm still going to, so get over it. Uh, tea and Teffy Day from our Irish friends and ancestors. Uh, the Feast of Yara and Lada from our Slavic friends and ancestors. This is connected to Maslanitsa. Uh, the Feast of Water Spirits, uh, East Spirits, and the Spirits of Spring from our Taoist friends and ancestors. And the Spring harvest from our Egyptian friends and ancestors. Um, so side note, <laughs> queen of tangents, uh, side note, we will start, even though there isn't a super hardcore emphasis on human fertility virility at Ostara, again, like I said, that's more at Beltane, but there is some now. One of the things that we do see are sacred couplings. Even if there is no sacred knocking of the boots, uh, there is still sacred couplings and sacred marriages where uh, oftentimes, one of the deities, usually the god, who uh, is connected deeply to the vegetation cycle, is like a personification of the vegetation cycle, has been on their underworld journey or they've been dead, and they are reborn at spring, they come back from their underworld journey at spring, something to that effect, and so they rejoin with their consort goddess. Um, and so where those two entities were apart, during winter, they come back together at spring, even if they don't actually get down to boning. Sacred, sacred boning. Okay, sacred, sacred. Um, so we see a lot of coupling uh, here, or uh, holidays that are dedicated to the both, you know, like in their consort form. Um, and then we have this spring equinox or spring harvest from the Egyptians, and this is something that we do see with um, uh, many of the civilizations that were right on the equator um because it's hot it's hot like too hot during late spring and summer and early fall to grow things it's far too hot and so their growth cycles often start in winter and they grow their crops through spring and harvest at some point in spring before the sun gets too high in the sky uh, other holidays that we will see at this time of year, like within the Ostara season, um, Proserpina returns from the underworld, so there's a goddess that's going on their underworld journey. Um, Kanamara Matsuri from our Japanese friends and ancestors, which is the Feast of the Divine Couple. There's another one. Um, Easter. Easter this year is going to be April 9th, I think, or April 4th, whatever the full moon is. Um, Purim we will see at this time of year. Uh, pass which we actually already we just had Purim. Uh, Purim can occasionally fall in in bulk season or uh, Ostara season. We just had it a couple weeks ago. Passover as well from our Jewish friends and ancestors. St. Patrick's Day, of course. St. Patrick, that's another one 
who owes me $5 and all of you as well, um, supposedly chased all of the serpents out of Ireland. There were no serpents. The serpent is a symbol of the goddess. And we will talk about that a little bit later in class. Um, what else is happening this year? Uh, Ramadan will also be happening during Ostara season. I believe the month of Ramadan begins March 22nd. That's not true every year. Uh, the Islamic calendar is a lunar-based calendar, and it rolls backwards by 11 days every year. Uh, so some years you're going to have Ramadan start in the middle of summer. Other years it's going to start at winter solstice or spring equinox or what have you. But this year it happens to be near spring equinox. So say hi to your uh, Muslim friends and give them a little help because Ramadan is a pretty intense uh, spiritual observance for them. They really go for it. Um, so some of my favorite holidays to talk about every year uh, from around the planet <laughs> during Ostara season uh, are all, one of them is pretty ridiculous. Uh, we have Holi from our friends and ancestors in India. Um, uh, Holi just happened. Uh, this was uh, the 7th and 8th with our last uh, full moon that was in Virgo. Um, this is the Hindu festival of colors celebrating spring and the triumph of good over evil, where people party in the streets, showering each other with colored powders and flower petals. Lord Krishna was in love with Radha, but he was ashamed of his blue skin. His mother suggested he smear a little bit of blue powder on her skin to make him feel better. This festival features very little in the way of prayers and is focused on having a good time, partying, rejoicing, and just like exchanging gifts and having fun. Um, from our Persian friends and ancestors, we have Nauru's. Uh, this is on uh, spring equinox. Uh, Na means new and Ruse means day or year. So this is an acknowledgement of the beginning of the solar year, but it relates back to a word that means light. So the newness of the light or the return of the light. Uh, this has been observed for over 3,000 years on the day of the vernal equinox. And this is New Year's Day for many, many people in the Middle East that still practice uh, those traditions. Um, another uh, festival that we have at this time of year is the Megalesia. And this is dedicated to Sybil and Addis or Kybel and Addis. I have a huge piece on my site about the Megalesia. It's wild. It's wild and very, very cool. <laughs> this was one of those holidays that I was like, I want to go back in time and go party at the Megalesia, please. <laughs> uh, this multi-day ceremony comes from the ancient Phrygians, freaky, freaky Phrygians, who lived where Turkey is now, worshipped as the Mother Mountain. Kybel was an all-mother goddess depicted with a city on her head, as we saw in that cult, in that picture. Um, like, let me pull her up as I'm reading this. Where are you, Kybel? There she is. The god Addis was her youthful and free-spirited consort who died and was reborn on an evergreen tree. Isn't there another, isn't that, that's a thing, right? Like, there's another holiday that does that. Isn't there a guy that, like, a, Chris, like a, like a pine tree is, like, a big deal? Am I making that up? That's a thing, right? And then he's like, he dies and he's resurrected or something. Doesn't he do that at like this time of year? Whatever. I'm, I'm probably just making that up. Uh, her temple in Rome was massive. Her priests, called Attis, would flagellate or castrate themselves as an offering to her. Now, check this out. The sacred site of this event is where St. Peter's Basilica now stands in the Vatican City. Now, let me freak you out just one more step here with this bad bitch. Kybel uh, in Rome was not depicted exactly like this. She didn't have a face all the time. The Romans were obsessed with reenacting rituals and traditions from back in the day. Uh, way more than we are. <laughs> in fact, we are closer to the Romans than the Romans were to uh, the people that, that like really worshipped uh, Kybel. Um, Kybel was thought to be manifest in a meteorite or a rock. Uh, and the Romans sent 
multiple waves of armies into what what we now call Turkey, but then was Anatolia, to go find this rock. And they did at some point find it or a meteorite. And they towed it back to Rome. Uh, when the rock made it on the boat to the city of Rome, they could not pull it up the river Tiber. It could only be brought into the city by women. So a bunch of women went down to the waterfront. Like, the boat wouldn't move in the water. So a bunch of women went down to the waterfront of the river Tiber, tied ropes around their waists, and pulled the ship in because it would not move unless women brought it into the city. They spent several years building a temple and a huge sculpture where they put the meteorite as the face of Kybel. So, Mother Mountain indeed. Now, Peter, St. Peter, that word means rock. Just gonna, just gonna leave that there. From our Japanese friends and ancestors, <laughs> we have Honen Matsuri. This is one of my absolute favorite holidays to talk about in spring. This festival dedicated to prosperity is held in a little prefecture of Japan about three hours north of Osaka. Those who turn up get turned up with probably drunk Shinto priests jamming on musical instruments and passing out all-you-can-drink sake from giant barrels. Once the crowds are lit, <laughs> the real show begins. The priests haul forth an eight-foot, 600-pound phallus and parade it through the village to the cheers of the festival goers. At some point, it is spun furiously before being set down and prayed over. And then rice cakes shower the crowds. That's the old-time religion that we all need and deserve. <laughs> so, have people been getting up to this for a while? Yes, they have. And are they doing it all over the Northern Hemisphere? Yes, they are. <laughs> they absolutely are. All right, moving on kind of quickly because I can feel my voice going. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here is our sky guide. Um, very briefly, here's our sky guide. Uh, what I want to say about this is uh, we are at the end, the tail end of a really cool phenomena um, of... Uh, us having the sun move into a sign and then having a new moon within a day of the sun moving into the sign. It's been a really cool uh, synchronous event. It's been happening since December. We had it December, January, February. We're having it this month and this will be the last month for the time being. I expect it'll probably wrap around and do it again next year at some point. Um, but we have the uh, new moon on, um, uh, that's not right. March 18th. I'm, I'm full of lies. It should say March 21st. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm a professional and I know what I'm doing. Um, so March 21st, we will have our new moon in Aries at zero degrees. And then in April, weirdly, very cool, we are going to have a second new moon at 29 degrees of Aries. And that will be a black new moon because it is the second new moon in a sign. Does not happen very often. It can happen, but it doesn't happen very often. And why this can happen is because the sun will stay in a sign for 30 days. The lunar cycle is 29 and a half days. So you can have the sun move into a sign and literally hours later, a new moon, which is what we're having here. And then just before the sun leaves and moves into the next sign, another new moon. Doesn't happen very often, but we have it this time. And, um, uh, even though we're in, in the astronomy part, um, astrologically speaking, that's really, really potent in terms of getting things started, right? New moons are, are really dialed in for that. We'll talk about that a little bit more when, when we get into the astrology section. Um, April 16th through the 25th, we have the Lyrids meteor showers. This is one of the brighter meteor showers, and we're going to have it right at the same time as a, as a new moon this year. So it is going to be a fantastic time uh, for going and watching shooting stars. There are dark sky guides on the internet that will show maps of the United States um, where th there's the least amount of light pollution 
and so you could go and drive, camp overnight, you know, or do your thing, whatever, uh, and find a really nice dark place to be able to go sky watching uh, and participate in this cool stuff. Um, and then later in the season, we have the Eda Aquarians uh, meteor showers as well, but that's going to be um, really close. Uh, oh no, that'll be, well, the, the height of that is going to be close to a full moon. So not, not, not as great of an opportunity for sky watching. Um, so moving into the astrology of the season. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Before I do, there's our constellations that we're working with. I'll just leave that up for a second. Um, so in our astrology, the sun is leaving Pisces, which we can see down in the right-hand corner. Um, and I think that even though we are, as far as Western astrology goes, out of Pisces as of the start of Ostara, I think it's really important to understand the energy of Pisces and what we're doing with it um, and what we, what we, what we did it, what we did in it and what we are still kind of doing, you know, the traces that it's leaving in us um, because it really is about dreaming and it is about potential and possibility and fantasy and uh, the utopian vision, the wish. Um, and, and that's really important uh because again, we're about to embark on this new adventure and we want to be able to come at this with like the brightest eyes possible, the most hope possible. Oh, I said a bad word. I said the four little word hope. I said it. And that's one of the key elements of Pisces. Before we head off into the fiery, I don't give a shit, you can't tell me nothing energy of Aries, <laughs> we want to foster some of that sweetness that's in Pisces. Um, so we're beginning to wake up and turn away from the infinite cosmos represented in Pisces and towards the physical world. And then as the sun moves into Aries, spring is here and it's time to begin. It's time to start, to initiate, to not only consider the authentic self, but to live it. Aries is technically uh the first sign and in astrology like when we're talking about our charts um aries oversees the first house naturally not everybody has aries in the first house that's totally normal um but whatever it is that we think about with aries there's some elements of that we can we can use some of those words to describe what the first house is all about the first house is where we have our fundamental experiences of developing our ego, developing our sense of self, developing our character and our personality, for better or worse, right? We might have embarrassing experiences and, and enlightening and uplifting and all of the above. So remembering that when we come around to spring again is really important of like, oh, I'm finding myself again. I'm discovering who I am and who I want to be and how I want to be perceived in the world. And I think it's very important to remember that the gods and goddesses go through this process. So it's very natural that we also go through this process and give ourselves an opportunity to reinvent ourselves to an extent or at the very least refresh and renew and recalibrate parts of ourselves at this at this point in the process so figuring out who what is my authentic self and then committing to actually living that in the world we individuate separating from the cosmic love soup of pisces and declaring ourselves to the world we put our head down and we butt our way into the world so when we are moving through this we will have our aries new moon and then we will have our full moon in libra and you can look at your natal chart and see what houses in your chart, house or houses, are connected to Aries. That might be where some adventures are kicking off, where some projects get started, where some issues come up to be dealt with or discussed or considered, um, explored, tried on. And then also check out your natal chart and look at where we have Libra 
house or houses that you have Libra in. This is where we're going to have our full moon in this season. And the full moons are about culminating. And so uh, this is going to be true for you every year. Every Ostara season, wherever we have that new moon in Aries, that house is getting lit up for you. And uh, wherever we have our full moon, wherever Libra is in your chart, you're going to be having a culminating type of experience or um, a moment of, you know, this has gone as far as it can go. <laughs> this has developed as much as it has. it's going to develop for the time being. Um, these are um, some meditations or some journaling prompts for you uh, if you want to work with them on the new moon and the full moon. Certainly appropriate. If you want to work with them during your Ostara ritual, also very, very appropriate. Uh, but writing down five challenges that you would like to achieve this year. And you know what a challenge is for you. So that could be very open-ended. That could be interpreted from a wide variety of angles. And then the artist's moon on the Libra full moon. Um, journaling on the relationship between the idea of artist as creator and god or goddess as creator. Um... And where are there similarities there between the artist and God? Um, and in what all ways can we interpret the word creator? Or just make some art or even just go see some art uh, can be really, really great on the Libra full moon. There we go with that. Oh, let me read this. Because I read them in every class and I don't want to not read it here, even though my, my voice is diminishing by the second. Leading up to a star, we purify and destroy parts of ourselves no longer serving the greatest good. We also wake up and fortify the self and the systems around us in preparation for the shift to the energy cycle coming up. A great way to get into alignment as you consider your choices about the coming year is to work on behalf of the group. Do some cleanup work around your neighborhood or a waterway or a water resource near you. And leave your goddamn phone in your pocket. <laughs> do the work for yourself and do the work because it needs to be done. Uh, and because this is the world that you actually want to live in. Spring kicks off with a surge of crackling energy and a thrust of ideas and driving passions and urges for life and arguments about fighting for what you believe in. And, and, and. Yeah, Aries is like that. Dominating most of the Ostara season, Aries demands that we open up and start experimenting with the combination of ourselves and the physical world. Listen to your body, give it what it wants. Maybe a rite of passage or an initiation would help you tune into this energy. It's time to summon the same audacity that the apple blossom summons, pushing its tender pink petals out from under the spring frost, knowing that there is a sunny day somewhere in the future. If it could just be tough enough to get there. But toughness alone will not turn a flower into fruit. It must be alluring enough to attract pollinators, uh, a.k.a. people and ideas and energies to mix with. So, as I said before, check your natal chart. Look at the house of the houses that are connected to Aries and Libra, and you'll get a sense of where you might really feel some extra emphasis during this season. So, moving on to tarot. Here are our two big tarot helpers for this season. The Emperor card and the Tower card. And um, Emperor is ruled by the sign of Aries. And the Tower is ruled by the planet Mars. And Mars is the ruling planet of Aries. Most people are like, oh shit, the Tower. You knew it was coming at some point. And um, it, when we can get over being weirded out by the Tower, we can see that the Tower is actually a really big helper for us. The other cards that we can work with at this time of year are the two, three, and four of wands. And I have a huge piece on my site about the two, three, and four of wands 
I also have a bunch of writing up about the tower and uh, the writing is in uh, is about the tower but in regard to Scorpio and the death card and working with the tower at uh, fall and Samhain season but it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition to think of that energy at this time of year I also have uh, here on YouTube uh, a two-hour lecture on Aries and the Tower and these three Wands cards. Why are we working with the Wands cards? The Wands are fire. And uh, the two, three, and four in some magical systems, the two, three, and four of Wands are connected to the sign of Aries. And so we would think of Mars in Aries, the Sun in Aries, and Venus in Aries. And when we step into a star season, we will have the Sun in Aries. We will not have Mars in Aries this year. We have Venus in Aries currently. Is that right? Yes, it's right. Uh, Venus goes into Taurus this week. Um, so the, the Three of Wands and the Four of Wands are actually happening right now, astrologically speaking. As winter ends, we dream under the moon, awaiting a glimpse of our inner light. We are frozen until the situation changes or thaws out, allowing movement and growth. We can get impatient, but we must wait and allow our new self to mature a bit before we present ourselves to the urges of spring. When we do burst forth in Aries, we are totally pledged to this new self and the new reality. We are armed with our sacred vision that we received during Pisces, and we are committed to it, for better or worse. But this kind of intensity can knock our other realities out of whack. It can even feel like a real breakdown. How might this play out in your day-to-day -day life? The 8 and 9 and 10 of Cups which are connected to Pisces, points to a deeper level of the emotional and intuitive process. We've come to a truth or an understanding about ourselves, a belief or a facet of reality in a way that we just feel on a gut level. And we now are pausing at the crossroads. We are sifting through all of the possible directions we could go with this new perspective. And then... Bam! The two, three, and four of wands says, Get up! Put your shoes on! It's time to go do stuff! Your new adventure has arrived! We're a little wary, or maybe we feel a little off balance, but that's the point. We try on this new version of ourselves that has this new perspective or belief. And we see what that's all about out here in the body. What is it like to be a person who believes, question mark, and acts on it? How does that affect our already established reality? So these characters are here to help us kind of summon the bravery and the foolishness <laughs> of stepping into manifesting things on the physical plane. For folks who've worked with me uh, and... Uh, have worked astrology with me, you know how I really harp on that equal armed cross as the cross of manifestation. Well, look at the legs of the emperor. There's our equal armed cross of manifestation. And the emperor is here to say, I'm, I'm here to manifest the vision. We had this crazy vision in Pisces and let's, let's go do it. But why the tower? What's up with that? The crown that's getting knocked off of the top of the tower is that that world building thing, right? Think of the crown slash wall thing that's on top of Kybel's head. It's that energy getting knocked off and saying, like, you've built worlds before. We kind of have to get that those old experiences out of here. So there's this juxtaposition with all of these characters of witnessing our accomplishments but not getting trapped in our accomplishments. Recognizing how much we knew and then being very vulnerable about what we don't know. All of these things. Uh, and allowing ourselves to grow 
to be taught something new to say, I don't know. And there is nothing wrong with not knowing. There is nothing wrong with ignorance. None of us knows everything. Like I said before, we could live 100,000 years and there will always be a new food, a new, a new song we've never heard before, a new star in the sky we've never seen before because we cannot know it all. And so the emperor sits very confidently in what they do know, but the tower is here to, re to remind us, don't get trapped in what you know or you'll screw yourself up. Allow that flash of enlightenment to come through, that shocking revelation to say, you don't know it all, and here's some new energy for you. Here's some new information. Is it destabilizing? Yeah. Would it be much more comfortable to sit where we are safe in what we know and everything is predictable? Yeah, it would totally be more comfortable there, 100%. But that's not healthy. That's not, that's not fostering natural organic growth. And that's what we want to be doing here at Spring Equinox is fostering natural and organic growth. So. Do I want to talk about this yet? One other thing. Before we get into this. Um. One of our big symbols that we work with at this time of year is eggs. And the egg is the cosmic egg. It's the cosmic womb or container uh, that is where all life begins. This idea of the egg as the beginning is something that we see in so many different magical practices and so many different religions and myth cycles and archetypal symbol sets around the world and throughout time. Uh, this very psychedelic one is from Hildegard of Bingen, a kooky, kooky Christian mystic who was a phenomenal artist. And, you know, you look at that and you're like, that's a vagina. For sure, that's a vagina. Eight-pointed star. Yeah, hey, okay. Uh, <laughs> but also the cosmos, right? And also, you know, that container and everything else. This is the Orphic egg. The black and white drawing is the Orphic egg. Um, the serpent holding the egg with three and a half wraps around the, around the egg. And these are cosmic entities or cosmic archetypal symbols that represent the totality of existence, the beginning and the end of, of existence, um, and the forces or the entities that oversee the manifestation of this, of all of, of all of what we're doing here on earth. Um, humans have been into this egg thing for a pretty long time. In fact, these egg shards were discovered at the Deep Kloof Rock Shelter in the South Africa approximately 77,000 years ago. Now, the colors are not as vibrant in real life. Um, the person that put these illustrations or these photographs together highlighted uh, the different patterns, but there are specific patterns uh, purposefully etched. Yes, we love Hildegard, absolutely. Uh, there are patterns purposefully etched and repeated on these eggshell uh, uh, pieces. Um, these were ostrich eggshells, and um, we know that people have been working with ostrich eggshells for literally maybe, o maybe over 100,000 years. But these egg uh, shell pieces were found, uh, I think they found them in the 90s. These patterns are something that we see over and over again, which is pretty trippy. <laughs> um, so going through time, uh, this is an ostrich egg found in the Isis tomb in Italy, uh, carved approximately 3,000 years ago, Punic Phoenician. Uh, note the circles with the various spokes up at the top and potentially some lions there. Minoan fresco from approximately 3,700 years ago. A reliquary made from an ostrich egg, approximately 700 years old. 
4,500 years old uh, gold egg from the Royal Cemetery at Ur, which is in uh, Babylonia. Uh, Punic dyed egg over 3,000 years old. And so coming up to today, uh, what you're seeing here are eggs decorated in the style of Pasenki, which is a Central and Eastern European egg dyeing and decorating tradition that is centuries old, millennia old, maybe more than millennia old. And one of the more interesting things here is that we tend to see a lot of the same basic patterns that we saw on those egg shards from the deep kloof, deep kloof rock shelf. Note the cross hatching patterns. Um, a lot of the same colors are used over and over again. Yellow for sunshine and warmth, green for nature, blue for sky and water, red for life and health, and black for the fertile soil and earth itself. And you'll see more of some colors and, you know, less of some colors on different eggs with different designs. Uh, but this cross hatching, right? We've got eight pointed stars here. Interesting. Um, we've got four and four. Um, and so that potentially those are our four seasons, but that cross hatching thing, we've talked about something that already had cross hatching, right? The woven, uh, symbol or drum, uh, the hand drum that Kaibel carries that maybe is a drum, maybe it's a sieve, maybe it's both. This is a traditional Pisenki design called a meander. And, uh, again, we have an eight pointed star here in the center. And the meander can represent serpents and it can represent water. Um, and again, you have this hatching in the background. So this is another traditional Pisenki design. Um, and this is a depiction of the goddess Matisida Zemlaya, whose name means wet mother earth. Now, what's very interesting to me is that the word bog uh, is synonymous with God in um, many Slavic languages. And I see serpents here. I see uh, six arms and si or three arms and three arms for six arms altogether. Um, I see a serpent. I see an earthworm, um, which our Virgo moon is our earthworm moon. And am I projecting all of this stuff onto this? Maybe, maybe I am. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. Um, I'm not saying that I am absolutely right. I'm saying, look at how all of this stuff stacks together. Isn't that interesting? Um, I, you know, I'm okay if I'm wrong. And I, and, um, and I don't mean that to say like, I don't care if I'm wrong, I'm going to stick with being wrong. I'm saying that, uh, like I don't have any ego attachment to be corrected later, um, or discovering that, you know, I misinterpreted something somewhere along the lines you know, this is sparking thought. I think that's cool. But, you know, <laughs> there's some pretty interesting similarities here. Um, so this is another traditional Pasenki design uh, depicted as Berahenia, which is a goddess. Um, and she is a goddess of life, death, rain, and fertility. This is all stuff that we're talking about here at this time of year. Note again, six arms or six limbs. Also note, that oval shape in the center, fairly fish-like, but also note the smaller oval and the bigger oval. Hmm, where did we see that? Wait a minute, huh? And also this cross-hatching. Even more intense cross-hatching with eight-pointed stars. And what is this design called? Reschetto. Okay. Um, black and red... Uh, white and red, black, white, and red, all very pivotal uh, colors used in springtime celebrations in Persia, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and other places. Um, so very, very interesting here. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is also Berahenia, the goddess depicted with the Rochetto pattern. Now look at the shape of her head and look at this. Are you kidding me? This is an official get the fuck out moment. Boom. Am I projecting? Maybe I am. But wow, that certainly seems very, very similar, doesn't it? 
And again, the cross hatching shape and the six arms, very uh, stark black and red design here, life and death, but also life and uh, the fertile black soil. And some anthropologists uh, have put forward that the cross hatching lines specifically depict um, the grooves cut into the ground uh, when farming, that they would have actually been like the lines of the crops. Maybe. So, yet another. <laughs> There's our fish. There's that triangle shape that we see somewhat similar. I mean, this is a, I don't know what that's called, a rhombus. <laughs> but, um, you know, three-sided, four-sided, but there's a similarity in shape there. But that's certainly a fish right in the center. There's our six limbs, again, um, of this goddess. And this is also referred to, this pattern is also referred to as a chukki because the uh, sound of it is similar to a beetle. Uh, the word for beetle. Um, now, beetles and scarabs connect us to another water sign, Cancer, but scarabs in Egyptian myth were responsible for pushing the sun across the sky and were part of their timekeeping myth and uh, mytho symbol sets. <laughs> um, also, the fish, wait, we talked about that. That's, hello? <laughs> That's kind of a big deal, huh? What? And this six arm thing. So thinking about this, let me show you this. Here is chai, uh, the Greek uh, word for, or the Greek symbol for Christ. And uh, on the other side, we have um, this six arm ch sound uh, in Cyrillic represented by this six arm thing. But the six arms can also be eight arms, and we see in that center square, this is the Greek depiction for Alpha and Omega, God, with the eight arms in a circle, but same symbol. The eight being also, the eight-pointed star also being the first letter in the name of the goddess Tiamat, who was a serpent goddess who held the world in her coils. Just going to put that there. And what I really love about this is the ch, ch ch sound, which would have been the sound that m your hand made as it played the rachetto with its woven surface, its fish scales. It would have been a ch 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 kind of sound. Maybe I'm just making it all up, but, you know, I'm going to just say that. Uh, last little things. We don't know when or why humans started to dye eggs, but currently we can trace the practice back at least to South Africans etching and staining ostrich eggs over 70,000 years ago. That's what we saw at the Deep Kloof rock shelter. Um, a common motif found on the eggs was a cross-hatching pattern. For the last 8,000 years or so, eggs have been synonymous with the ideas of birth and beginnings. This idea is the cosmic egg. And I'll pull that back up for you. Maybe. From which all life in the universe springs forth. Hens and rabbits have been the deliverers of these eggs in many myths, but the further back we look into history, we can see one creature as the source of the most ancient tales, the serpent or the snake. Sometimes with wings. The world serpent, who is Tiamat, Typhon, Idahuedo, the Rainbow Serpent, Shesha, Ouroboros, and a hundred other names holding the world within their coils, biting their own tail, and creating the circumference of the known world. Today, we see eggs as a central theme for Easter, Nauru's, and Passover, as well as Ostara and other springtime traditions. Many Eastern European ethnic groups still decorate eggs. forward again for you guys so you can look at those as a religious act during easter in the ukraine this is called pasenka 
And these delicate treasures are made by painting on beeswax in patterns and then dyeing over it, leaving a negative space behind. Archaeological evidence points to this being a pre-Christian tradition. Really? Hmm, you think? <laughs> Carried forward by a hidden symbol of the goddess sublimated into Catholic practice like many pagan rites and used for protection. Popular patterns that we see on the Pasenki are dots, triangles, curls, or spirals, or even a single curl with wings, which I meant to put in this collection of pictures, but I always forget every year. The curls are an ancient symbol of the Slavic goddess Marisira Zemlaya, whose name literally means wet mother earth. She was a great goddess with power over life and death. She was eventually joined with the Slavic goddess Mokosh, whose name possibly means moisture. She is a weaver and spinner goddess who also has power over rain, life, and death. She was often depicted as a wet bog. She is still worshipped in unbroken lines today. Zemlaya also means serpent. And in this name, uh, you also find an ancient water god. This can also be depicted as eternity bands called meanders, unending lines of waves or ribbons around the egg. Another popular goddess that is depicted as a pattern is Berahenia, a goddess of life and death, rain and fertility, depicted with two or four or six arms outstretched. They are often called chukki, which means beetle, because the six-armed goddess looks like the Cyrillic letter ch. This, name, this image is fairly similar to the symbol chai the Catholic Church uses to represent Christ, also known for his fishy symbolism. An even more popular motif is the cross-hatching pattern called reshetto, which means sieve, and dates back to Paleolithic times. A reshetto is also a Ukrainian folk instrument. In ancient times, it was a wooden ring hit with a stick called a sieve. Later, a screen made of fish or goat skin was woven over it and played like a hand drum. Alresha is also a star in the constellation of Pisces, also known as Tiamat or Typhon, and it means string or cord. So... There is some very deep and very interesting symbolism for you guys to work with uh, here with all of that stuff. Um, Kybel and world building and the great lines that we will draw on the earth and the wet earth and the dark, rich soil that we get to work with and all of that good stuff. So bringing me back to our ritual forms. Honoring young people in rites of passage, beginning projects in the physical world, preparing the garden, and that can also be the garden of your life, uh, planting seeds, dyeing eggs, flower divination. This is one of my favorite um, spells to do during Ostara season or magical workings. Um, literally go out wherever the, you have wildflowers or wherever there's flowers growing that are cool to pick. Um, and pick the first three different flowers that you find. Then you bring them home. You can pick more than that. Save some for the next person. Don't take them all. Um, pick ethically, right? Um, but those first three, look them up and find out what magic they are connected to and what they're for. And that's the answer to your question or the piece of advice that the universe has for you. Wandering through nature, you know that I say that in every single class, wandering through nature is one of our most uh, time-honored ritual forms for witches and pagans, witnessing, smelling, tasting, touching the earth as it changes shape. But potlucks, bonfires, sex and sensuality, whatever that means for you, spring cleaning and new clothes, and even going to a clothing swap where it's just new to you, it's not necessarily new, that totally counts. It's perfectly fine. Um... All of these are really excellent ritual forms to engage in. Symbols that we might use on our altars, phallic wands, sprouting plants, eggs, baskets, shamrocks, babies, and childhood. Like pictures of yourself as a kid, very appropriate. Um, a yellow disc or a wheel and seeds of any kind, especially seeds that we might have gathered last year 
at the end of the growth cycle, um, initiating them now into the next growth cycle. Food and drink. Um, we, uh, I always put these up for you guys. Hot cross buns. Oh, we didn't talk about it, but hot cross buns possibly go back to Egypt, um, because they would have had that equal armed cross of manifestation. And they literally meant like, you know, the town center, like the, the center of the action where things are happening. Um, some mineral helpers for us to work with diamonds, Herkimer diamonds and clear quartz are all ruled by Aries. So is iron, uh, and, uh, all red stones really are appropriate to work with. Uh, plant helpers, myrtle, shamrocks, and uh, clover in particular, definitely. And all of our plants that are coming up right now, a lot of these are not edible. Um, they're just for looks, <laughs> which is sort of a thing. Um, but violets, you know, in uh, hearkening to Kybel, which we didn't talk about, but read it. It's in the, it's in the piece on my website. Peonies, hyacinths, tulips, etc. Snakes and serpents, rabbits, lambs, calves, chicks, dams, all newborn creatures are very appropriate animal helpers um, to invite to work with. Um, and when working with animal helpers, I, uh, I always try to lead with an offering and lead with a request, uh, not a demand. Um, we don't want to tell animal helpers that they're going to work with us. We want to invite them and ask them if they would like to work with us. And then if they respond positively, cool, go ahead and work with them. Uh, incense and oils that are very appropriate for this time of year. Cucumber, violet, jasmine, rose, geranium. I think I like geranium even more than rose. Uh, iris, alder, lotus, etc. And some meditations for this season. You are rebirthing after winter's sleep. In the name of the youth, see a vision of potential and possibility. What is that vision? The passions of love and fear can run deep in us. How can we find a balance between the light and the dark? And you are earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. See yourself as a balanced being. Write a letter to yourself from that place. These are all very appropriate ways of sort of initiating yourself into this season and opening up to this season uh, and, and its energies. Last but not least, um, support your local warrior. Uh, trans folks are really being persecuted at this time in our uh, country's history for absolutely no good reason at all. Um, and so supporting queer folks, supporting queer kids, supporting trans kids right now is exceptionally important. Um, trans Lifeline, exceptionally important group. The Trevor Project, exceptionally important. Um, and also supporting other marginalized groups like black people, indigenous people, um, and other people of color. And so Black Immigrants Bail Fund, um, the new community bail fund, those types of things. Um, there's a lot of protesting going on around cop city in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, and a lot of the money from here is going to go there to my patrons and my students. Thank you. Uh, there's so many of you now I'm going to have to do a different graphic because, uh, I, you almost can't see the names anymore. <laughs> Y'all are gone buck wild. You have gone buck wild. What are you doing? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. You freaks. You absolute freaks. Last but not least, if you uh, are new here, come work with me. I do tarot readings. I do astrology readings. You can sign up through my website. Uh, we can talk about pagan spirituality, magical consultations, tarot mentorship. I do teach tarot workshops throughout the year. I may have some coming up soon for spring. So if you're not on the newsletter, sign up for the newsletter. Um, of course, you can also join my Patreon to support this work and to get even more stuff. Again, at the Venus level and higher, that's nine bucks a month and higher. You can get the workshop, the calendar with uh, literally hundreds of holidays per, per season and so much more. Uh, these live classes, uh, Spinning the Wheel podcast that I put out just about every week um, and also my incredibly... Uh, irregular newsletter and my blog on my website. Thanks guys. 
we made it two hours. Thanks for putting up with my voice. <laughs> I think I'm going to go be uh, very quiet while I drink some hot tea <laughs> and go lay in bed. Uh, I do feel mostly better, but I'm still a little, well, and clearly I'm still a little, blah. but um, thank you. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you have a beautiful Ostara season. Um, if you have questions, if you have comments about this, you can certainly leave them down in the comments below, but send me an email. Let's talk about it. Um, leave a comment on my website. Let's talk about it. And um, let's explore this stuff, right? Who knows what the fuck is about to happen? <laughs> Happy Ostara, everybody. I'll hang out here for a few minutes if anybody has any questions or comments that they'd like to leave in the chat. Um, but the video is going to officially end. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Blessed be. Okay. I'm still here. <laughs> Leave flowers in the chat if you're good. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, if there's anything that you wanted to comment on, I'll hang out for a few more minutes. And there's a lag always between when I say this and when you guys actually hear it. So I'm literally going to hang out for a few minutes. <laughs> Love, love, love. Thank you. Yes. I really am on the mend. I, I don't sound like it, but I really am on the mend. <laughs> but I don't sound like it. I sound very congested. I am very congested, but I feel like 100 times better than I did this time last week. <laughs> I will. I will get some good rest. I'm going to go drink a, a nice giant cup of hot tea. Yep. Tea and sleep. I slept so much when I first was really, I was like, wow, I'm just gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to sleep for four days. I guess that's how that's going to go. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> but that's all right, right? Like this is the season. This is the season for, for that kind of drifting. That's what's up. All right, you guys Mwah. love you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all of your support. Uh, and I'm looking forward to whatever the frick shenanigans we are about to get up to in this season. It's going to be, it's going to be one for the books. It's going to be one for the books. 100%. All right, everybody. Blessed be. Good night.